Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. This week we're joined by Ken Coleman in the co hosting seat. Ken, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing fabulous, Tia. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. No major complaints. The Lions did win, so yep. that is a, a very high point for me today. Absolutely. But what's I, going on for the what's going on for the program? Well, what's going on for the program? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, an internationally acclaimed mother and son duo plan on opening a new space along Jefferson Avenue in Detroit uh, with the goal of preservation, education. Uh, and the appreciation of art in the city. And that sounds like a cool thing. Yeah, it's really, really cool. They also love to give back and make sure that kids are learning art as well. So really looking forward to that conversation. But Ken, you are a historian. <laughs> you give tours. You talk about what's going on in the city of Detroit and beyond. So what is going on with uh, history in Detroit today? Well, when we flash back to you to 1840 uh, here in Detroit, Fanny Richards mm. Um, was born in Fredericksburg, um, uh, Virginia. She moves to Detroit, Fanny Richards does, as a young child. And she ultimately, Fanny Richards does, becomes Detroit's first African-American school teacher How cool. uh, in 1869. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And there's more. <laughs> of course, uh, this is the home, the automobile capital uh, of the world. And in 1908, uh, the uh, automotive mogul Henry Ford introduced his everyman's car, mm. the Model T. Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. We're rolling now. Absolutely. We're really rolling. <laughs> uh, rolling big time. And that, that uh, Model T sold um, you know, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of vehicles uh, uh, of the Model T uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Moving closer to home, uh, and on the on sort of a baseball theme and uh, Hist- uh, Hispanic Heritage Month um, in 1930, or excuse me, in 1983, Aurelio Rod- uh, Rodriguez of the uh, Chicago White Sox played his last major league game. Now you might ask, Tia, why are we talking about a Chicago White Sox yeah, player? Yeah. Uh, Aurelio Rodriguez played a big bulk of his uh, major league baseball career in Detroit. Nice. Rodriguez was born in Mexico. Uh, and early in his career, as I pointed out, played for the Detroit Tigers for nine seasons. Uh, he was a gold glove third baseman. And that's one of the highest defensive honors um, that a baseball player can earn in Major League Baseball. So that's a little bit about what happened on October the 1st uh, in Detroit's history. That's amazing. Did not know any of those things. So that is great that we got to learn a little bit more about what's up with Detroit's history. So starting out the conversation depending on who you are, religion means a lot to you. And for many black Americans, the idea of religion intersects with freedom in a complicated way. Enslaved Africans came to this country with religions and traditions, most of which were stripped upon arrival and replaced with new forms of worship. Once the freedoms of black Americans were slowly granted after the Civil War, the ideas for what the future could look like and how to achieve that future were beginning to take root. Black-led cities, towns, and small communities began to flourish. Many short-lived, but their ideas of a paradise on earth persisted. The Black Utopian Searching for Paradise in the Promised Land in America is a nonfiction look at what happened when Black Americans were dreaming of better lives in different ways of religious thinking. The book follows along the histories of these movements, including the history of the Black Christian Nationalist Movement and the Shrine of Madonna in Detroit. Joining us in studio to chat more about the book and its significance is Aaron Robertson. Aaron is a Detroiter, a writer, an editor, and a translator of Italian literature. Robertson is also a Rhodes Scholar, having attended Oxford University in England. Aaron, welcome to the Metro. Hi, it's great to be here. Of course, and once again, I always ask Detroiters, what side of Detroit are you from? West side, of course. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> how it is. West side, best side. Yes, you know, that's just, you know we're going to keep that... In this little circle here. (laughs) But just jumping in, when you began writing the book, where did the core question of the book come from? What does utopia mean to you? And what does it mean to black Americans? Yeah, in part, the question of utopia is very personal. So uh, I grew up, you know, going to the small town in Tennessee where my grandparents are are from. It was called Promised Land. It was an all black town Mm -hmm. that was founded in 1870. So soon after the Civil War ended and during the Reconstruction period. Um, And I was so interested in this really vibrant history of uh, Black-led communities and Black-led spaces in which African-Americans attempted to create, you know, better lives, um, you know, for themselves. 
Um, and I knew that this was kind of a broad history that stretched from, uh, you know, the Reconstruction era up to the present even. I mean, I think we saw since 2020 a kind of explosion of Black utopian initiatives and conversations. So you can think of the conversations that were happening around, um, you know, reparations, um, questions of reparative justice and um, how to really transform the world so that black people feel provided for um, in not only in politics, but, you know, uh, in education, right? And, and sort of being able to provide uh, food for communities and spaces of spiritual uh, spiritual refuge as well. So all of these questions were central to the book. And you begin the book uh, in Promised Land, Tennessee, your ancestral home. You talk about going back and, and being with your grandparents. I have similar experience not going back to Tennessee, but going to a country, a rural space, going to dirt roads and a farm and seeing chickens and cows and having this real, really mixed living and growing up of having the city life versus this country life and this understanding and having that, that, that space that feels safe. So can you talk about that experience there and go into the town's history a little bit more, but why you consider it your ancestral home? Yeah. I mean, it's my ancestral home, you know, simply because my, my dad's dad was born there and he was so proud of being from this, this small town. And as a kid, you know, I didn't have a great appreciation for the history necessarily. It was just kind of an escape from the city, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was an opportunity to be with you know family and kind of have family reunions. But as I grew older, I realized that this was one of many towns um, that were scattered throughout the American South, throughout the West too, um, where you know black communities had sort of coalesced out of necessity and need. Um, my grandfather was always insistent that his grandchildren really embrace this community, embrace what it meant for our family. Um, and so the, I think the, the, the sort of weight and responsibility of that uh, began to sort of settle uh, as I grew older. Yeah. And, you know, Promised Land is one anchor for the book, but you also talk about Black Nationalist Commune and what it looked like and how it came about. So as you're going through, you're, you're, you're learning, you're, you're researching and finding these spaces and places. What did what was going through your mind when you found out about the Black Nationalist com, com, Commune? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think when we think about utopia in general, a lot of us may uh, think of the kind of hippie communes that were spreading in the 1960s, you know, the back to the land movement where mostly, you know, white middle class, younger people, um, you know, would 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 uh, leave society to uh, try to. To stake out a better life, a summer of love, for example. Exa- exa- yeah, totally. Yeah, and yeah. those those stories are very, you know, important to understanding, you know, what the counterculture actually meant. But African Americans have always been central to uh, what we think of as the American counterculture. <laughs> and so, uh, when I learned about the the shrine of the Black Madonna, um, and all of the sort of experiments that the church was involved in. I realized, well, okay, here is a black nationalist church that was active during the late 60s and really um, began some of its, like, some of its most radical experiments in the 1970s. Well, this was a period that directly overlapped with uh, the countercultural period in general. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to uh, kind of uh, create a counter narrative of American utopias. Um, and I think the shrine was kind of a natural place to start. Um, I had this personal link, obviously, to Detroit, but I grew up going to so many kinds of churches in D- Detroit and the surrounding area. But I didn't actually learn about the shrine until 2019, wow. <laughs> which is so yeah. uh, strange in retrospect. Yeah. Um, the, the churches that I went to, I, I'll say, were not, uh, the emphasis was not on political activism. Sure. Um, that was not central, really. And so to learn about this church that was trying to uh, create innovative, you know, educational experiments that was trying to um, establish communes throughout the country, um, that was, you know, sending out these cadres of missionaries around the country to raise money for decades so that they could eventually 
in the late 1990s by thousands of acres of farmland in South Carolina. I mean, what this was an incredible story. Um, so I, I wanted to explore that. Oh, I mean, you know, uh, right now, if you're joining us, we're chatting with Aaron Robertson, the author of Black Utopians. We're chatting about the book and its death in-depth look at religion and freedom in American black culture. And you just hit on something really, really great there because you're talking about uh, going to different churches. I grew up in a Baptist church as well with my uh, grandparents going to different churches throughout uh, Belleville, Sumter Township, but as well going throughout the city of Detroit. And I often think about the connection there between black Americans and religion and how we formed our different ways of worshiping. So in your mind, when you're seeing the black uh, nationalist commune, you're seeing the shrine of uh, a black Madonna. What are some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of your personal connection with religion and what you just learned in 2019? Because you're learning it as an adult man. You're yeah. a man, you know, you're grown <laughs> yeah, and right. you're learning something new that's a new hit to your ideas of religion. So what did it do to your way of thinking? Yeah, I, I think one of the remarkable things about Albert Clegg Jr., the pastor of the shrine and, um, you know, the philosophy that he es- espoused, which, you know, he, he called black Christian nationalism, um, it, you know, he was attempting to redefine the foundations of what Christianity meant. And so he is best known for popularizing the idea of a black Messiah, um, you know, and, and if you if you go revolutionary, yes, black yeah. Messiah, exactly. And if you walk into the shrine, you know, one of the first things you'll see is a mural of a, a black Madonna and child. And I think at the time, and even now, you know, that that sort of uh, it, it is seen as really uh, radical, yes. to, to say the least. Some people called it heretical. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, and I think that in, in, in normal stories about the shrine, that is kind of where the story ends. You know, you had this pastor who said that Christ was black. But actually, in in, in saying that and in, in pushing that narrative, um what Albert Clegg was telling his people was that, uh, you know, the foundations of reality as you know it may not be, you know, um, we can transform those. You know, mm-hmm. all of the stories that we inherit from society, uh, we, you know, we have the right and ability to question those. And so if, if religious beliefs can be turned on their head, then maybe political beliefs can too, and maybe beliefs about how the economy works can be turned upside down as well. Yeah. So I think that sort of you know theological um, innovation that mm-hmm. Clegg um, that he instituted was the starting point for a much larger revolution in hmm. um, how we think about Black life in America. Yeah, you're listening to the Metro. We're chatting with Eric Robertson. Uh, he's the author of Black Utopians. Aaron, let me go back a little bit. You know, we kind of talked about the maybe the thirty-five thousand foot. I want to go back to a little bit of your um, your childhood and your and your uh, sort of maturation, if you will, uh, as it relates to religion. Um, you were raised in Baptist churches, as you pointed out, um, both here uh, in Detroit and outside Detroit. Um, you write in your prologue. I, th- I think it's really interesting. Um, you write you write that even as a child, you felt that. Uh, you thought yourself growing away from the church. In fact, you uh, write, and I quote, the spirit of your grandparents' religion uh, was, was, was moving away from you, has faded uh, in you. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. It's. I think as I grew older, um, some of the beliefs that I was raised with, you know, I, I began to feel a bit distant, I think, from uh, the traditional church as I had known it. Um, you know, I, I think that now I probably identify as agnostic, um, <laughs> but still, you know, like even if you grow grow distant from some of the beliefs that you were raised with, at least in my case, um, the, I think the strength of community that that, yeah. that church is imbued it sticks with you, and I feel, on the one hand, although I've grown I've grown distant from mainstream Christianity. I also feel that uh, the kinds of communities that I was exposed to and raised in were so essential to who I am now. And I think that there's a part of me that, that longs to kind of recreate some version of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that, uh, that is really also at the heart of what it, what, you know, like what is the point of writing about utopia? Well, 
utopia is always about the alternative lives that you could have lived. Um, you know, and I, I, I think, you know, what if I had grown up in a, in an institution like the Shrine of the Black Madonna, yeah. which was so insistent that its children be raised, um, uh, learning about like black revolution and black mm-hmm. politics and black history. Um, I eventually learned about that stuff when mm-hmm. I went off to college, but it yeah. took me a very long time. Um, and so there, there was a part of me that sort of, uh, I think a uh, part of me romanticized yeah. some of the, the, um, what the shrine represented. Yeah. But I also think it's important to be careful about romanticizing, you know, too much. Mm-hmm. And Aaron, before we let you go, because we have been, we're pushed here on time, I want you to get into the event that you have coming up. You do have an event, a talk that we're going to be uh, experiencing tonight. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to experience. Yeah. So tonight um, at six at the Detroit Food Commons, um, I will be having the book launch. Uh, Great. I'll, yeah. I'll be in conversation. Thank you with David Goldberg, a professor at Wayne State university good so dude com- yeah i've yes. done a lot of work with David. <laughs> yeah yeah he, he's he's amazing um so come out to that there will be book signings afterwards awesome aaron robertson is the author of black utopians let's get the whole thing the black utopian searching for paradise in the promised land in america you can catch aaron tonight with wayne state professor david goldberg and you can see them at detroit food commons that's on woodward avenue that's at 6 p.m aaron thank you so much for joining us on the metro can't wait to learn how you do with your book launch thank you so much i appreciate it This is the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. Coming up, we'll hear about a conversation happening tonight at Wayne State University with former juvenile lifers about their experiences and why they're making the case to ban life without parole sentencing in Michigan. You all stay right there. The Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham here with journalist and historian Ken Coleman. Thank you for having me. Having a great time. Yeah, we've got a great broadcast uh, as we continue uh, here on the Metro. uh, And as we move into our next segment, what do we do with young people who've done really bad things? For a long time in this country, our response has been extremely harsh. Essentially, The idea is throw them in prison and never let them out. In the late 1980s uh, and 1990s, Michigan adopted punitive uh, criminal policies. At one point, at one point, Michigan had incarcerated more juvenile lifers than any other state in the country. Uh, But while um, while it's still possible, uh, life without parole sentences are not automatic and much less uh, after, much less likely after U.S. Supreme Court rulings banned or limited these sentences. Still, uh, many in uh, the criminal justice system are trying to end life without parole sentences completely um, in our state of Michigan. Uh, And tonight, several former uh, juvenile lifers are speaking at Wayne State to hear, to share their stories uh, as part of a panel conversation on a film called Life Beyond Life. Again, Life Beyond Life. To talk more about tonight's event uh, and what the alternatives to harsh criminal sentences can look like, uh, we have our guest, uh, Mr. Ronnie Walters. He's here with us. Ronnie is moderating the event at Wayne State. Uh, He is a community engagement specialist with the uh, organization called Safe and Just Michigan. Uh, And he's a former juvenile lifer himself. Ronnie, welcome to the Metro. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we've we've said a lot in the open uh, and I certainly want we want certainly want to spend some time getting uh, not only into the policy, the public policy piece, um, but I obviously talk a little bit more um, about the uh, tonight's event and, and the film. Um, you're moderating uh, again that event tonight at Wayne State. Um, uh, why is this event important to us? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Mm-hmm. Um, this event is very important because it challenged the prevailing narrative that people sentenced to life without parole are irredeemably 
um, irredeemably that they can't be redeemed. Mm-hmm. Oh, let me get this mic yeah, straight. Right. Thank you. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tonight we, I think tonight we had an opportunity to um, humanize these individuals, to understand their journeys, and to recognize that people can change and grow even after committing heinous offenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's really important. Yeah. And Ronnie, um, you know, we have Life Beyond Life that will be uh, screening tonight at Wayne State. I want to play this cut from the film Life Beyond Life. Lorenzo just wanted to apologize. What do you think it would do if you gave people the opportunity to apologize for the harm they committed? So I'm going to go to that clip right now. Okay. When they sent out notices and said that, uh, you know, we was going to be resentenced, we was going to get back to court, it was so important to me. I didn't care about anything else. I told my attorneys and everything, I don't care about anything else. But I really want to speak to the family, and I want them to really know how apologetic I am and how sorry I am, you know. And that was worth to me the sentence. That was worth more than anything else to me is just to tell them that I don't care if the judge turned around and gave me life again. That was the weight that was lifted off me. And mm. and Ronnie, you talked about humanizing people and you mm-hmm. talk about in stress that, you know, humans are humans and sometimes people do bad things, but they make mistakes and they can be redeemed. Now you hear Lorenzo here talking about an apology and really wanting to make sure that he gets that point across. What do you think that would do if we encourage that more in society and made space for those who have done harm to give them that space to do that? Yeah. Um, good question. The ability of apologizing, um, was profound act of humanity for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I acknowledge the harm that I caused and expressed sincere remorse to my victim's family. I think it could begin the healing process for myself. Mm. Um, I needed to take ownership of my actions. This freed me to focus on the capacity of growth. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really important to uh, uh, Ronnie, and we appreciate, uh, we appreciate your testimony. I can, I can hear it in your voice. You're not only an, av- you're an advocate, Mm-hmm. Um, but you've 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 gone through you've gone through that uh, you've got a testimony yeah. uh, about this uh, about this important issue. What do you think about accountability? What should accountability look like? You've got people in Lansing and people on Capitol Hill in D.C. Um, who say that kids have done who have done extreme things uh, like having killed someone or been an accomplice mm-hmm. to killing someone. They should be locked up and throw away the key. Can a mm-hmm. 15 or 16 year old um, um, can they be? Um, can they go through a process, um, obviously, of you know, of, of, of uh, going through the criminal justice process, and then at some point getting out and being a productive um, mm-hmm. uh, um, man or woman right. in uh, in America? Yeah, um, I think accountability is is really strong with myself and all of the juveniles that I know. Um, it's important to hold individuals accountable for their actions. However, life without parole is overly punitive. And it's an irreversible sentence, especially for juveniles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we believe that the approach that we're taking in these bills that we're trying to get passed to end life without parole in Michigan is more just and more humane for the juvenile. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that we're trying to put in place where you are accountable to the parole board for your actions or actions that from your crime and how you conduct yourself while you're in prison. So yeah. it's a it's a process that you have to go through. It's not that you're gonna automatically get parole. No, if you don't um meet the criteria, then you are less likely to ever come home again. Mm-hmm. But we feel that being that they are juveniles, they have the capacity to change, to grow. And to show that growth over a period of time and present that evidence to the parole board where they would make a decision if you could be safely um, returned to society. Yeah. And Ronnie, uh, you know, I think about a lot of younger people who are in situations where they may be facing life uh, without parole, uh, especially, you know, young young people. Um, and I think mm-hmm. about the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, for young people to have this large capacity for hope. A lot of kids, a lot of young people in general. They haven't been through enough to to not have that hopeful feeling and hopeful. But these kids have been through some things Mm -hmm. and these young people have been through just like yourself. You've been through some things. So how do you keep hope, number one? And then how do you teach the hope to those who you are pleading to? How do you how do you convey that hope and that 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 
Mm. Hope for a future. How do you convey that to people? Um, it's, it's, it's something when the world is telling you over and over that you are uh, a worthless piece of, piece of garbage, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But you know that the worst thing that you've done in your life should not define everything that you do in your life from that point forward. So you, be, you begin to go inside yourself and look for things that are redeemable qualities mm-hmm. and build on them. And, and you understand that, that if someone could ever take a look at me as the person I am today, that you would have a different opinion on, of me and perhaps give me a second chance. So this builds hope that someday someone will see that I'm not the worst of the worst. Someone who see that I, that I can be a productive and positive citizen if given that opportunity. You know, it's it's it's, it's really, and I appreciate um, I appreciate your candor, Thank uh, you. Ronnie. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. I think maybe some of our listeners uh, here on the Metro um, this morning are asking themselves uh, a little bit more about your situation to the extent that you want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think you were, as we pointed out earlier, you were a juvenile lifer without parole? Uh, do you think um, you should have, uh, or should have been, uh, there should have been a fairer response to you? Um, in your case, uh, um, I kind of understand um, why um, the response was what it was towards me. Um, but we need to let people know that even when someone commits a, a awful crime, a juvenile commits an awful crime, that they have the capacity to change. Their brain is not fully developed. Mm-hmm. The maturity level is, is completely just ridiculously low. You know, we've all um, seen kids where, we, you know, if you're a parent or something, you ask them, well, why did you do that? And the kid is just mystified. Like, I really don't know why I did yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So because he's not his brain is not fully mature. And to hold um, a juvenile accountable the same way that you would hold an adult is just cruel and unusual punishment. Mm-hmm. You know, because this juvenile will change. He will age out of crime. And he will become the person that we all would hope him to become, you know. And these are the people that we're advocating for release, you know. Mm-hmm. But not a slap on the wrist, not oh, uh, uh, over a period of time, mm-hmm. you have the um, ability to transform your life, to, to really think about what you've done and how you can improve on some of the things that you're doing now to become a better human being. And then if you can convince a parole board that you are a better person, transformed, completely aged out of crime, mm-hmm. then we think that you should have a shot at returning this to society. Yeah, yeah. I know I went to high school with, um, with a Michigander who served uh, several decades. Um, mm-hmm. He was a juvenile lifer, and he was released uh, in recent years, and he's doing beautiful things in the community um, sharing his story uh, as a cautionary tale. And I think that um, he is someone, at least in our community, that people respect, understood he made a horrible mistake th- 35 or 37 years ago, paid for that, uh, and is now a, 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 a great productive uh, member of, of uh, the Detroit, Detroit community and a, and a great Michigander. Right. Yeah. That's why we believe um, um, at Safe and Just Michigan that mm-hmm. – um, um, by telling your story, by telling, you know, getting people to listen to the stories of former juveniles and what they went through, this was able, able to make them more humane, more, more human in people's eyes. And absolutely. And we feel that once you learn our journeys, then you can understand that we have changed and other people who we left behind mm-hmm. can have the same capacity of change also. Well, Ronnie Waters, we certainly appreciate you. Uh, many of us will be there tonight um, uh, from 7 p.m. to 8.30 at Wayne State University uh, on the campus of Wayne State University at the Undergraduate Library. Ronnie Walters, Community Engagement Specialist at Safe and Just Michigan. Uh, He'll be a moderator panel tonight for the screening of Life Beyond Justice. We thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to seeing all you there tonight.
It's the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. Quick look at the forecast. Rain and thunder after 3 tonight. 77 degrees is a high. Wednesday, tomorrow, sunny with a high around 69 degrees. Thursday, mostly sunny and a high near 74. And Friday, mostly sunny with a high around 70 degrees. So it looks like the fall weather is going to stay a little uh, uh, warmer for a little while longer. News. Uh, in the news, United Auto Workers President Sean Fain presented a strong and uncompromising front during last night's State of the UAW speech. Fain said uh, that his members are ready for the challenge presented by big business. Uh, Fain spoke uh, as the union threatens to strike Stellantis uh, over what he says uh, is the automaker's rollback of obligations. Um, that they agreed to in last year's contract. We should point out um, that, uh, just as a heads up, many of our uh, WDET employees are part of a union uh, that is currently under the umbrella of the UAW. Coming up, we'll hear about the grand opening of a gallery and a renovated art studio on East Jefferson along Detroit's riverfront. You all stay right there. On 1019 WDETFM, I am Tia Graham here with journalist and historian Ken Coleman. Ken, how's the Metro been treating you so far? Treating me so well. I, uh, as I said yesterday, I was just I was worried that you wouldn't call me back for the second day <laughs> or maybe the third and fourth day, but I think I'm hanging in there. Your phone good. wouldn't stop buzzing. This <laughs> oh like, oh Ken, boy, Ken. I'm Ken. big man on campus now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No pun intended, because we're on Wayne State's campus. You know, I love that. <laughs> but jumping into the next conversation, art is an expression, and as such, it has the ability to tell stories and weave us all together. That's the theme of the grand opening of a newly renovated studio, gallery, and event space on East Jefferson in Detroit. Threads of Connection is an inaugurate, inaugural exhibition and is being run by two artists that are a mother and son duo. How cool. Linda and Teddy Schinkel. They are here now to discuss their art, the way Detroit influences their designs, and what it's like to work with such a close family member. Linda and Teddy, welcome to the Metro. Thank you. Well, lovely to be here. Oh, awesome. yes. Thank you for having us. Of course. So, Linda, talk to us about your art design in the firm. You work a lot with glass and aluminum. How would you describe your work? Well, I describe my work as multifaceted, and the whole goal of the work is for connections. We have a universe of work. We call it a, the Metaliverse. We began in 2010 creating our work together. Of course, we first I started working together. Yeah. So I created with my son really since he was very, very young. Mm-hmm. I've worked that we, and we've worked together since he was very young. And, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit and why it's a natural progression for us to be working together. But um, we wanted to create something that we felt was really Detroit. And we said, you know, what can we do to do that? And Teddy said, how about working on metal? And I'm like, yeah, I love that. And you know, we first started experimenting with metal, but then with the intention to first like print uh, photographs onto it. And oh. then through that experimentation and showing examples to individuals, he said, you know, what if that little blemish in the corner was throughout the entire artwork? And then that kind of led to the next thing. And then we developed our own process of making this two-dimensional sculpture yeah which then became mixing it with uh, different media. So then, you know, you know, photography, you know, painting, you know, etching, really using it as a, um, uh, you know, as a substrate that, you know, for all its, you know, various qualities. And that's kind of evolved uh, over time. And then, so Metallogram, that's the multimedia metal and... The first um, one, the yes. first one they created. And really, it was like necessity is the mother of invention mm-hmm. because working on metal was expensive. Yeah. And so that's why we got this metal that was slightly altered and in seconds. And it was through that that we, we realized what it could do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. how, how cool is that, right? It's Detroit. Then, it's yeah. so Detroit. Absolutely. Yeah, so Detroit. And then we yeah. Yeah, started talking to folks who mm-hmm. could help us then figure out, okay, so how do we do an automotive finish? Right. Because we didn't have a background in that. Yeah. I had a background in painting and drawing and and brought that to the photography and I wanted to figure out how to combine all that 
to make it come alive. Mm. Mm. So we know you've got this great grand opening coming up on Thursday. Sounds very exciting. Uh, radio is theater of the mind. You're on, uh, on Jefferson uh, along the riverfront. Uh, in Detroit, give us a sense of where you are. What are some of the landmarks? Uh, yeah. uh, so in 2016, so we started in 2010. Mm-hmm. Then in 2016, we were looking for property because we'd been working out of my home. My home really was a factory. And uh, <laughs> and we thought we could, okay, we thought we finally, you know, had enough we could scrape together, to, you know, to buy some property. And Midtown was already too expensive. Mm-hmm. So we started looking downtown and we found this sweet little property. It was actually sold, but but then it came back onto the market it had been owned by the the city of Detroit from the 70s to 2005. Wow. And the, what the city did is they operated it as the Morass House Museum mm. and the Detroit Garden Space operated out of it. And what's so cool Detroit about Garden that? Detroit Garden Center. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what's so cool about that is they already did a lot of renovation. I mean, there still was a ton of work that needed to be mm-hmm. done. But for a home that was built in 1840. I mean, no, so it is the, the oldest brick house oldest, in the city. Absolutely. Yes. So we're talking about, for our listeners, we're talking just east of uh, I-375. Uh, uh-huh. uh, uh, it, well before you get to uh, St. Albans. So just and outside of downtown Detroit. And across from the Rivertown River Marketplace. That's right. Yeah. The Myers. The Myers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's a real right there. Yeah. perfect yeah. example. I know exactly where yeah, you are. Absolutely. Yeah, and, then, <laughs> cool. and just the other side of the block of the Dequinder Cut. Yeah, mm-hmm. kind of yeah. like you know, in between those two places. And so it's really, it's really kind of you know it. You know, in the middle of the downtown area, but the uh, there really is kind of a secret garden courtyard, like in the back. So that's why. So wow. the event space, the name that we call it is the Detroit Secret Garden, because mm. it's kind of mm. interesting. In the middle of the city. And then you walk to this very green space in the backyard where you hear all the nature sounds. And then if you go through the backyard, then the river walk is then you know, right over right there. The, so it kind in of, your backyard. So it kind of brings that <laughs> very it. urban and, and wildlife and you know, our together very well. Wisteria, our wisteria is, so the owners told us that U- University of Michigan certified the wisteria, which was pot- potted in our little potting shed right there. Okay. And, and planted, so there's a really cute little potting shed in the back that's so charming uh-huh. that that's what, the, when the city owned it, they, they put the little potting shed there, and we're using that to show some art. Anyway, so they said that the University of Michigan certified it as the oldest or one of the oldest wisteria plants in the Midwest. How amazing is that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Not a, only the oldest building, but you also have one of the oldest wisteria plants there as well, which is... it's And it's a focal point. It's, it's just gorgeous because... We've extended the trellis so you can go under it, and it, it just has such really cool vibes. And the garden has definitely inspired our art. We have used a lot of the art. So since 2016, we've been using that space as our studio. Uh-huh. We've used it a little bit as a showroom, but it's taken us a long time. It's been a labor of love for eight years because wow. because it needed so much work. So yeah. now we're finally ready, and we're just so excited. I can hear it in your voice. Mm-hmm. We're, you. we're excited for Long you. Time coming. you. Absolutely. Uh, if you just joined us, uh, we're speaking with L- Linda and Teddy Schenkel, uh, Schenkel uh, who are uh, hosting a grand opening of their art gallery uh, coming up this week, a renovated uh, studio along the Detroit River, as we've been talking about. That'll be on Thursday. Um, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Talk about y'all's connection with making kids and young people, engaging them in the arts. Yeah, we've, we've, been, do- we've been doing that a lot. So when, what's really cool is the mayor's going to be coming to speak. And Great. the reason the mayor knows about our work is his. we have a piece of our work that we created at Central High School. So we, Teddy and I, we donated our time. We donated the materials. Okay. And we uh, Beyond Basics is a charity. It's a literacy charity, and they're doing a lot of work with DPS now, but back then they weren't in, in too many high schools, but they have an art enrichment program to, to get engagement with the kids because it's a voluntary program. Mm-hmm. The teachers recommend mm-hmm. it, but it's a voluntary program for this literacy improvement. Sure. So um, we first of all, though, we started, we started with the Cranbrook Institute of Science. Mm-hmm. We won a big award right in Beverly Hills, California. We won Best of Show for Art Innovation. Wow. And design. That was in 2013. Okay. When Cranbrook Science Museum learned about that, they commissioned us to do a piece, and they had funds in their budget with kids kicking cancer. 
So our hmm. yeah, and so that was our first collaborative. Our first collaborative work, yes. So and we yeah. Mm-hmm. So we had um, about you know it's, so it was kind of like a field day in the museum, you know, working with the charity. So we came up with the design, we created the original design, you know, kind of throughout most of the piece, and then along the border had some stencils for the different you know children to kind of you know you know, uh, you know, engrave it and fill in yeah. and then sign their name along with it. And then that piece is actually, you know, has been installed and still is oh, in cool. the Cranbrook Science Museum. And it's 11 feet by five feet. It's a big piece and wow. there's built in lighting. Mm-hmm. So then Detroit Country Day, they hired us to be the visiting guest artists. And we have a huge installation there. Uh, it's over a 50 foot installation. We were hanging with, mobile. Hanging so mobile. it's like a, a hundred cool. pieces that yeah. kind of, you know, spin independently and that's, you know, still installed there. So then we've done a couple of these projects. And then we volunteered yeah. to do, then we volunteered at Central High School and we did that with the kids in Detroit yes. and the kids, the kids loved it. Yeah. The, oh, it's just so, oh, just so heartwarming <laughs> for us to work with the kids. So we donated to the city and they ended up doing a video about us. Wow. The city's kept it up since 2015. Mm-hmm. That's and when we asked the mayor if he would come, because we don't know him. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, they said yes. So we're thrilled that you're saying yes. And for me, it's really full circle. I was born right down the street on Jefferson, Crutchmark Hospital. And my mom said I was born on, on D-Day, 6-6. My mom said she was watching folks go to Belle Isle. Yeah. And she met my father. and My parents mm-hmm. are both both Detroiters. Born in Detroit, met my met each other in Belle Isle. Wow. And here I am, born on the east mm-hmm. side, and I grew up in East Detroit. And you're back in, you're back on the I Lower am. East Side. Yeah. Yeah. Linda and Teddy Shinko are artists that run Shinko Fine Art and Art and a design firm that is announcing the grand opening of its newly renovated studio, gallery, and event space at 161460 East Jefferson in Detroit. It's happening Thursday from 5 to 9 p.m. Linda and Teddy, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. Us. Of course. This was fantastic. Wonderful. This is the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. Coming up, we'll discuss a new bill that would give home care workers the ability to unionize. You stay right there. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham here with historian and journalist Ken Coleman. Thank you for having me. Tia, as you know, unions uh, are generally associated with a few uh, different types of jobs, uh, jobs that uh, involve work in a factory, uh, jobs that are involved uh, in government. Um, But unions have also been on a decline in recent decades. And uh, unions still exist for many workers today, um, such as uh, for nurses and journalists and professors. And now the state of Michigan wants to make it easier for another type of worker to be unionized. I'm referring to home uh, uh, home health care workers. A recent set of bills passed by the state house and Senate would allow uh, home health care workers to unionize. To discuss these bills for a few moments uh, and the possibility that they will be enacted into law, um, we have Elena Dernball. Uh, Elena is a house reporter, a state house reporter for Gangwer News Service of Michigan. Elena, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. How are you? Doing pretty well. Uh, slower day in Lansing this week than it was last week, but that gives us time to catch up on uh, everything that happened when the House was in session when they were here. Well, let's get right into it with the few moments that we have left. What will these bills do? Um, uh, just uh, just flat out, what would they do? Uh, flat out, they give home health care workers the ability to be part of a union. Um Previously, that was an option. Uh, it was a Grand Holm initiative uh, back mm-hmm. in 2004. But then under former Governor Rick Snyder, uh, that ability to unionize was taken away in 2012. And so this set of bills brings that right back to home health care workers. Let's get right to the politics of it. We know that uh, Democrats have a slight majority both in the state House and the state Senate. Uh, the current governor, Jennifer Granholm, uh, is a Democrat. Uh, is she expected to sign this legislation? 
Yes, Governor Governor Whitmer has expressed her eagerness to sign this legislation and get it through. Um, it did not get immediate effect in the Senate, so it would not be enacted until 90 days after the legislature closes its books for the year. And what ta- what that happen- what happens in the technical sense is had it got immediate effect, meaning two thirds of both the House and the Senate, if they had voted for it, it would have gone into uh, effect uh, immediately after the governor signed. Is that correct? Correct. Absolutely. Uh, so you're in your story, uh, Amanda Fisher, uh, the Michigan State Director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, said, quote, uh, the definition of uh, this is the definition of government outreach. Uh, what was her, why did she make that comment? Sure. So there has been concern from um, many Republicans um, and organizations that are typically not uh, big fans of unions that uh, this would allow unions to take union dues out of the paychecks of home health care workers and then that money would then be going towards unions and then the unions would use that money to lobby the government. Um, There's also concern about this uh, council that would be created um, for kind of the overseeing the the benefits and um, the the training and kind of support systems for home health care workers to kind of interfere in how this the system is working and kind of exert too, too much control over uh, home health care workers. And um, the thought is that it doesn't effectively get at the problem, which is that home health care workers aren't being paid enough, and Republicans and these other groups would have liked to see different solutions to increase the pay of these workers rather than unions. Okay, certainly. Uh, we certainly appreciate you um, spending some time with us, uh, Elena Dernball, um, spending some time talking about this important uh, uh, union issue. Uh, uh, Elena is the reporter, a house reporter for Gongra News Service of Michigan. Elena, thank you so much for joining us again on the Metro. My pleasure. This is the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. We will definitely get more information about those bills a little bit from uh, more from the news department later on. Uh, just make sure you stay in tune to WDET 1019 WDET FM. Uh, but just throwing this in there, Ken, before we end the program, the Tigers do open the American League wildcard playoffs against the Astros. That's in Houston this afternoon. That first pitch is set for 232 p.m. Always those odd times with baseball, but really looking uh, forward to it. Absolutely. And Tia, Mm -hmm. that's the Metro for October the 1st. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and uh, make sure to describe to subscribe for the podcast uh, and your favorite uh, on your favorite platform. The show also, uh, as you know, airs on YouTube, if that's the way you like listening to uh, the Metro. Uh, This show, of course, is produced by Sam Corey, David Lyons and Jack Philbrandt. Our engineer is Nate Bender. The music, the great music, is offered to us by Sam Bobian and Will Sessions. Yeah, Will Sessions actually just played, Ken, and uh, it was a little late. They, they play late. They play closer to midnight than they do 10 p.m. So, ah, you know, ah. that's one of those things. You need coffee and you need a nap <laughs> you before go. you see Will Sessions. But they're great to see. The Metro is right. a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University. If you like what you hear and you want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate this. It's WDETFM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Thank you so much for listening. Ken, we will be back tomorrow. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Mm-hmm.